on skill-based treatment in schools. I'm Amy Cook, BCBA and Community Manager from Hyrasmus, and we're so excited to have you all here. We wanted to empower you to make a meaningful impact on even more students through SBT today. To kick things off, I'll provide some insights into Hyrasmus and then introduce our founder and CEO. Following that, Dr. Greg Hanley will give a comprehensive overview of SBT in schools. Next, Dr. Claire Egan will present on achieving meaningful outcomes using PFA and SBT in schools. Then our chief commercial officer and advocate for 1 million kits, Rachel, will elaborate on how Hyrasmus enhances the SBT experience. Finally, Dr. Hanley and the team will be here to answer your questions. I wanna share a little bit more about Hyrasmus. Hyrasmus is an ABA clinical software company that was inspired by our founder's son, Rasmus, who was diagnosed with autism early on in his life. Our goal is to help deliver the highest quality behavioral therapy services to 1 million children with autism by helping the people who help them, behavior analysts, techs, teachers, parents, and clinical directors. We provide the best clinical platform so you can keep the focus on the child in front of you. With that said, I'll let Nikolai introduce himself and share how SBT has impacted his own family. Thank you so much. Um, thank you so much, Amy. Um, and thanks everyone for, for joining. This is, uh, uh, I think this is uh, the, the largest amount of people we've had joining one of our webinars. So I'm super excited about that. I'm very thankful for a lot of people putting a lot of faith in, uh, in, uh, in, in what we're doing here and, and being interested in, uh, in what we're doing and especially also, also of course, what, uh, what Greg Handy and, and, and his team is, uh, is doing. Um, uh, as uh, Amy mentioned, um, I have a very uh, personal connection with, uh, with SPT um, um, from my, my own perspective and with my own son. Um, we are from uh, Denmark originally, um, and um, uh, Erasmus was in school in, in Copenhagen uh, in, uh, in Denmark and, and struggled a lot with that and had some really, really like, bad experiences with, uh, with, with school, uh, unfortunately. Uh, we moved to Dubai um, after he'd been school, uh, in school for a few uh, years, but with the um, uh, with 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 some luggage for him uh, to the point that he had troubles even just entering a a, a, um, a classroom. It was really really difficult for him to be around that. The school was really really helpful and working a lot together uh, with us uh, on on that and with him and really trusted that that he was able to uh, and, and, and could benefit from, uh, from being an in inclusion and being part of a, a, the whole school experience and school environment. Um, unfortunately, it was also very, very difficult and, and, and we kept trying all kinds of, uh, of uh, things together with the school, uh, but he actually, for, for a period of time, and this was with COVID as well, so there was a lot of things that were difficult at the, at the time. But at, the, at, a, at some point, he was even in a, in a like, separate building from his normal classroom, and there, were, there was a lot, of, uh, a lot of tension around this. And we were like seriously considering if we were doing the right thing. Uh, we really trusted that we could see he had he had he had, he, he made friendships in, in school and, and and there was there were some bright sides but there were also some very um, like severe uh, incidents as, uh, as well that were very challenging for us to to handle um, and um, at, at some point um, I had a, a conversation with Greg about this and he pointed to to SPT and said, um, I am completely convinced that that we can that that Rasmus did, can do this and and that it's it's we can we can help him with uh, with this um, and um, so we gave it a shot and uh, and and worked worked closely together with the school um, uh, on this with his learning support assistant in in school with his classroom teachers with other parents as well um, um, in. Um, in 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 implementing the, the 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 whole SPT program for for him, and even though things still were very challenging in the very early uh, phases of uh, of that, we also saw 
very uh, rapid progression with some things that we had not thought that, that we had thought would see we would see found in the in the future actually with uh, with with these uh, with these things um, he um, he transitioned to the same building towards the classroom and and gradually transitioned into to a a, a more and more normalized uh, school day for for himself. Um, there were ups and downs on the on on the on the way in in many in many in many ways, um, but um, but 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 um, but we could really see that he also became happier and happier about going in the mornings and coming home in the afternoon, uh, which of course is kind of like the the the, the barometer that. The, that you somehow have to to measure things on whether things are actually working and whether it's not just um, uh, adults <laughs> having making plans for for kids, but uh, but also a, a, a kid that seems to be thriving more and more, and we and we really did did see that. So that was that was a really good uh, uh, that was a really good experience. Um, and I think I think he was in the SPT program for like intensively for like between six months and a half year or something like that until he really transitioned into 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 like um full-on classroom uh, experience um and so really appreciated that wanted to share one thing um uh, one um uh, uh, a little video with uh with uh, with you guys from where this all uh what this all led to and where this all um ended for 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 him um in primary school so this is uh this is rasmus graduating his primary school after being back in the um back in the um uh, classroom after be getting back on on top of things with uh, on the academics and and stuff like uh, like that it's the he was in a, a British school so that's <laughs> That's uh, the whole the whole experience here. Um, um, but um, yeah, this was probably the, the happiest day of, of our lives as uh, as parents to see him so proud of himself, see all his uh, his classroom friends um, sit there in the audience, clap of him. Um, um, yeah, just really uh, supporting him in uh, in in that journey. Yeah, sorry, I'm actually gonna get uh, slightly uh, <laughs> uh, emotional about it. Uh, still, when I see when I see this uh, this video, um, and now we're in the US. We've tra he's transitioned into to middle school. He has full days in middle school. Has less and less support uh, with uh, with that. Um, he has uh, is following the regular curriculum uh, with his uh, with his class uh, classmates, um, and yeah. I um I just personally owe that uh, very much to uh, to of course to him for 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 doing for for doing his part and and really participating but also really for 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 the SPT process and and what can de develop around uh, SPT so um 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 all um all 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 good thoughts from uh, from my side and um and yeah happy to share that experience with uh, with you guys here. So wonderful. Well, thank you for sharing that, Nikolai. We're now going to hand it over and let Dr. Hanley introduce himself and talk a little bit about SBT in schools as well. Okay, very good. Uh, can you give me a thumbs up if you can hear me, uh, Amy and team? Okay, very good. Uh, my name is Greg Hanley, and um, I lead a behavioral consulting group from Worcester, Massachusetts called FTF Behavioral. And uh, we simply try to help people uh, do compassionate forms of ABA uh, to try to address severe behavior, prevent it, intervene upon, and some other uh, common behavioral issues like sleep problems and feeding problems. It's an honor always to connect with Hi Rasmus. Uh, we tried to get this skill-based treatment platform uh, or process into different platforms for a while now, and we're never successful. And we need to find somebody who had two things, uh, the smarts to program it and the heart, the motivation uh, to do it well and to stick to it because it's hard to program intermittent, unpredictable things like we're asking for. And we found that in Nikolai and the High Rasmus team and Rachel and Amy. And so, again, I'm really happy to connect uh, and share a little bit, uh, just an introduction on what SBT is, where it is now, and then really hand it over to the expert, my colleague, Dr. Claire Egan, who's really been super successful uh, transitioning kids uh, with SBT 
uh, into schools. And so uh, I'll give you a short uh, little treatise on uh, SBT now. Uh, so for those of you new, maybe uninitiated, the acronyms can be uh, irritating. So I'm going to define each of the PFA is practical functional assessment. SBT is skill-based treatment. We spend a lot of time in training on practical functional assessment because when you do a practical functional assessment, you are identifying almost everything you need for treatment minus a couple forms of behavior. Okay, so when we go into the analysis, we start with an open-ended interview with people who know and love the child. And from that, we try to pick up what the problem behaviors are, what the precursors are, and what the contextual uh, factors that may be influencing the behavior are. We trust the information people tell us. We don't worry about the subjective in this process, but we do verify the subjective through analysis. And it's an analysis that everybody can do, whether you're a BCBA or not, whether you're in a hospital or not. It, everyone can do the analysis because it's safe. Everything is engineered for safety. First thing we try to do in the analysis is create a context which problem behavior is zero. Give them all the suspected reinforcers for problem behavior. Drive that behavior to zero. Do not escalate them. Bring it to zero and bring the joy. We also emphasize heavily about the affect and the physiology of the child before we attempt to challenge them. We call that HRE. We're constantly talking about get HRE before you take that next step. The next step is to empower the learner. And this is a little counterintuitive for non-behavior analysts, but we've been doing this in behavior analysis for a long time. What we're going to do is challenge that learner. And at the first sign of protest or problem behavior, we're actually going to reward it. It's very counterintuitive. But by rewarding it, we're teaching kids, you do not need to escalate ever with me in this context. Every little behavior will do. We try to teach kids that we see you, we hear you, we understand you. By so doing, we turn on their behavior and turn it off. That also empowers the teacher. It teaches them that no matter what the conditions are, they know how to turn off problem behavior. That's what the PFA is all about, bringing the joy, empowering the student, empowering the learner. It doesn't take a lot of time. PFA is on the par of minutes to hours, okay? No longer the days of months in, uh, to do FBAs, okay? The PFA process is done in a matter of minutes to hours. Then we do SBT, and like Nikolai said, SBT might take some time. Sometimes it takes weeks. Sometimes it takes months. Sometimes it becomes a lifestyle as we generate repertoires of behavior. SBT, skill-based treatment, is just task analysis, chaining, and shaping. But what we are chaining together are sequences of social, emotional, and contextually appropriate skills that are relevant wherever we're doing the therapy, which often these days is in schools. Those contextually appropriate behaviors we're working on obviously are simply IEP-based goals, okay? But before we get to the IEP goals, we're going to give those kids a voice. We're going to make sure we get that communication going. Then we're going to teach them to tolerate when that communication may not work sometimes. And then we're going to teach those contextually appropriate chains of behavior. And they are not replacement behaviors, folks, in SBT. Anyone who's done this knows this. They're ex temporally extended chains of behavior, and they require practice. As much time as you would give practice to an athletic skill or a musical skill, we need to give to the IEP-based goals for kids in school. Skill-based treatment is not just a bright idea. I love that social media is getting out a good bright ideas to students. This is an evidence-based practice that's been around for now for uh, 12 years. I'm showing you right now the only studies that are either review papers of the process or they've shown socially validated outcomes. Mont Wolf in the 70s asked us to socially validate the outcomes of our behavioral intervention to ask constituents, are you satisfied with the amount of behavior change? Sadly, that hasn't happened in functional assessment and treatmentville for 30 plus years. I still can't find a single study for another process where a parent or teacher says, thank you, the problem solved. And that's why I'm a bit of a one trick pony and advocate for PFA and SBT because over 10 research labs in eight different countries have replicated this process and shown socially better. And I'm only talking about published works. I know hundreds of others who have done this successfully in schools. It started out in clinics. Many people think of this only as a clinic procedure or maybe a specialized ABA school. It did indeed start out that way. But it has been applied in schools since 2015. And nowadays, more people are applying this in schools than ever before because people like Dr. Egan have taught us how to align skill-based treatment, the clinical process, with IEPs, the educational process. They are not 
two things a school person does, they're the same thing. SBT simply gives a scope and a sequence to what school-based psychologists and BCBAs are generally obligated to do with kids with severe problem behavior. Understand if this is new to you, what are the hallmarks of this PFA and SBT? What makes it different from a typical ABA or functional behavioral assessment process? The first thing is it champions compassion, always showing concern for the learner in the moment. There is no working kids through their tears. There is no trying to change behavior programmatically through punishment. Punishment is ubiquitous. We're simply not going to program it. We simply try to be responsive to the learner. We bring the joy. We figure out when they are ready for the challenge. And then we teach precisely where they are. We first accept their first responses to challenge. And then from there, we shape and chain together skills. It's all done with an open door, both literally and metaphorically. It is a full ascent-based model. We have the ace in our back pocket, knowing that kids prefer to earn their reinforcers and get them for free as long as we make them attainable. And so this process is all about making those reinforcers attainable and making ever so slight changes in the expectations over time. And by so doing, we can eliminate severe problem behavior, wedge it out by developing complete repertoires of behavior. If you want to learn more about this, there are two places you can go. There's more, but I'll show you these two. Uh, the first one is where you can get some training and consultation. Uh, that's the FTF uh, website. And again, there's on-demand courses and <clears throat> there's opportunities for consultation. By contrast, there's a website called practicalfunctionalassessment.com. I talked a little bit about evidence in this introduction. You can go there and find all the research articles ever published on this process. Take a look at them for yourself, please, okay? Uh, there's also some success stories uh, by people uh, uh, that bothered to get consent and wanted to tell their stories, and they're available on that free website as well. Okay, I'm gonna stop talking. I'll be around at the end if there are any questions, but I'd like to pass it to my colleague, Dr. Egan. Thank you so much, Dr. Hanley. Uh, Dr. Claire Egan will be presenting. I am going to put in the chat some handouts uh, that you should be able to, oh, hopefully that one works. I'll get another link if it doesn't, um, for some handouts that go along with her um, presentation. You have to unmute you, Claire, when you're ready. Sorry about that. Um, let me reshare my screen. Thanks so much for that introduction. Much appreciated. Okay. Give me a thumbs up if I'm where I need to be, Greg. Perfect. Thank you. Um, it's such a pleasure to get the opportunity to talk to all of you today about the topic of achieving meaningful outcomes in school contexts using PFA and SBT. Um, as Greg mentioned, I'm a lead consultant with FTF, and I work with an incredible team, and they are the people that have equipped me to be able to actually talk about meaningful outcomes, so I'm really grateful uh, for everything I've learned from them. But in my former life, prior to FTF, I also did a lot of work uh, with and in collaboration alongside schools. And so I do understand some of the unique challenges that are faced in dealing with severe problem behavior in school settings. So those are some of the things that I'm gonna incorporate into, into the presentation today. I think it's important to start by saying um, that the purpose of this talk is not to teach you about how to implement PFA and SBT. So that's beyond the scope of what I'll be able to cover in the time I have today. But I do want to make it my goal to give you an overview of how the PFA SBT process aligns with school goals. And I'll present some video clips and some data on three students who experienced PFA and SBT in school settings to try to support some of those ideas. So I'll start um, to talk about what, what does this mean? What does it mean to achieve a meaningful outcome in a school context? 
And meaningful outcomes will obviously vary from student to student and from school to school. But some of the most often cited uh, priorities for individuals with challenging behaviors include outcomes like achieving long-term reductions in those severe problem behaviors, achieving IEP goals and other types of, of goals, transitioning learners from more into less restrictive environments, being able to fade support, and having our learners experience what I'm calling genuine inclusion. Uh, Dr. Hanley has already referenced the wealth of research that's out there on the efficacy of PFA and SBT to reduce severe problem behavior, but it's also important to ask the question, what do we know about the extent to which PFA and SBT can lead to these types of meaningful outcomes in school contexts? And we do have evidence from the literature that these meaningful outcomes are achievable in school contexts through PFA and SBT. We know it can be effectively implemented to reduce problem behavior. We know it can be effectively used to reintroduce educational instruction for students with autism after they've had prolonged breaks from school due to problem behavior. We know it can be used to successfully support transitioning students back to school after similar removals due to problem behavior. Teachers can implement and generalize the intervention to schools with a high degree of procedural integrity. Um, Long-term follow-ups indicate that behavior changes are maintained in school contexts, and we certainly know that these processes have social validity. So teachers, paraprofessionals, and parents value the process and the outcomes. So the research is giving us a message of hope. We can do this. It is possible, but that doesn't mean that it's easy or that the path to success is linear. There are school specific barriers and considerations that need to be navigated as we make our journey towards these types of meaningful outcomes for our students. And a good starting point is to have a strong understanding of how the PFA SBT process aligns with the goals and priorities that school based teams have when it comes to meaningful outcomes. And that's really the purpose of this slide to illustrate the goodness of fit that exists between the sequence of steps in skill-based treatment and the commonly cited goals that schools value when it comes to supporting students with challenging behaviors. So in skill-based treatment, we always begin by replacing problem behavior with communication. We then build cooperation by teaching toleration, relinquishing and transitioning skills. And then we move into skill building. And this is where IEP and other priority goals for the school really can be incorporated. And then finally, we work on making learning contexts more challenging and generalized with the goal of extending the learner's cooperation into real life contexts. And this can include contexts with faded support and opportunities for meaningful inclusion. But it is a first things first process. And here's where we begin. So we always start with these early steps of replacing problem behavior and building cooperation. I'm gonna talk through these phases in skill-based treatment step-by-step step and use some students as case study examples to illustrate how we move from the introduction of skill-based treatment all the way to achieving some meaningful outcomes. And I'll start with the early phases of communication, toleration, and cooperation. And I'm also gonna share some lessons that, that we've learned along the way. So I've included some video clips and some data for three students who received instruction in PFA and SBT in schools. And there were a few reasons I chose these three particular students. So they each had different profiles. They had all received PFA and SBT support in a school, but each had slightly different contexts. They all progressed in consultation to at least a CAP-6 challenge or to generalization and extension. Uh, we had permission to share their data and their videos publicly. And most importantly, they all taught me some things that I didn't know about how to be successful in public school contexts. So I'll start by introducing these little people. Uh, DM was a five-year-old male when he started. He came with a lot of letters after his name and he really had lived quite a complex life for a little person. When his mom brought him to our program, it was kind of the last stop on a long list of unsuccessful school experiences for him. So by the time he got to us, 
He'd already been expelled from six preschools due to what was described as explosive and aggressive problem behavior. He transitioned also into foster care during his time with us, and he just encountered a lot of challenges along the way. Um, he was a student who engaged in frequent aggression directed towards peers and adults, and he also engaged in property destruction. And he would have these extended periods of, of escalated behavior that could go on for you know, up to 40 minutes at a time. For DM, he, he received PFA and SBT intervention in our intensive classroom-based program. Um, and due to his problem behavior, it was decided that he would defer kindergarten and attend our program instead. And the goal for our program was to transition him into grade one in a public school setting. Um, JB was a six-year-old boy without any formal diagnosis at all. He attended kindergarten in a public school setting and FTF was contracted to provide consultation to the school he attended. He was one of the students that was selected for treatment because of the problem behavior he was experiencing in the classroom. And that included things like swearing, climbing, throwing, um, aggression, and, and, and other disruptive behaviors. We coached his incredible team in the, in the PFA SBT process, which was initially implemented in a pullout space in his school and then generalized back into his classroom. And finally, JP was a nine-year-old um, autistic boy in grade three in an elementary school. Uh, however, he attended school in his own classroom and he hadn't participated in the, in the general classroom for about a year prior to treatment. And this was another school that contracted with FTF to support their team to learn the PFA SBT process. And JP was one of the students that was selected for treatment because of his behaviors. He had uh, tantrums, aggression, and extended periods of, of protesting. And so we started PFA SBT in his own um, segregated room and then worked towards returning him to his classroom. Despite all these differences in context, our goal for these students was essentially the same, to successfully transition them into a mainstream classroom in a school setting. Here's some information about the students' uh, early treatment. We started skill-based treatment and taught them to communicate the my way response in, in response to challenges. We taught them to tolerate when their requests were denied and we taught them to give up their preferred reinforcers and transition to areas of high expectation to prepare for learning. And these data show just the mean number of trials that each student required to master those five steps, as well as some mean numbers for the mild problem behaviors or R2s and the more serious problem behaviors or R1s. Overall, all three students varied in the number of trials that they required, but they were all able to successfully master these steps with relatively low numbers of R1s and R2s. And just to make a note, although DM had higher numbers of R1s and R2s, one of the changes that isn't reflected in these data is that they represented much milder forms of the behaviors than prior to intervention. So I'm going to show next a video example, um, just to show you what some of these early steps looked like for these learners. I want you to notice some things that these successful teams were able to achieve in these videos, because I think that these are some of the things that are key to success and they're difficult to achieve in school contexts. So the first is this idea of synthesized reinforcement. And each one of these three students had reinforcement contexts that were difficult to achieve for one reason or another. Um, one of the students required such a genuine commitment from on the part of his implementers to pretend play. Um, and it was exhausting for the team to keep up with what he wanted, but they did it. They did an incredible job with that. Another student's team uh, made the difficult decision to reintroduce a gaming switch back into the school context. It was something that had historically been removed because it had been associated with problem behavior. And that was a difficult decision for the team to make, but they decided to bring it back in for SBT. And another student really required quite a bit of flexibility around being able to leave the treatment space and venture into other areas of the school. And again, this was something that required some troubleshooting on the part of the team. At the start of the process, we also sometimes need to learn to let go of some of the things that we've been trained to do as educators or, or interventionists. Success with some students actually lies in our ability to say less, do less, ask for less from our students, 
push boundaries, jump in puddles if we need to, and sometimes just relinquish control to our learners. And these are things that can be really difficult, particularly in the school context. Um, these teams that I worked with in, in this talk did this exceptionally well. And we're never finished with SBT until we can reintroduce hard things and hold students to a high standard. But we already know we can't start there. Students with severe problem behavior are telling us that. So in this video, we see um, just a couple of clips. Um, one is um, a really nice synthesized reinforcement between implementers and the students. And it just shows you the level of flexibility and um, energy that they were putting into the reinforcement context. Um, let's get started. To the to the left now. You ready? Yeah. Go to the yellow. Yeah. Okay. Are you ready? Yeah. I You're so fast. I love that clip because um, the implementers were flexible enough to allow him to leave the space and come back in. I think initially they were a little concerned. There was a lot going on in the school at that time, um, but they went with it. They made it fun. And it turned a situation that could have been one where we were putting in boundaries and creating problems. They let it go. And it turned into just an opportunity to build rapport with the student and teach him that he had a little bit of control in that context. This is another clip of the same student. And it's just him going through these early steps in SBT. So you'll see him communicating, tolerating when his implementer denies or says no. Uh, giving up the things that he loves and transitioning to an area to show that he's ready for learning. Okay, so these students were all able to successfully navigate the early stages of PFA and SBT, but it was not without its challenges. And we really learned some valuable lessons along the way. We learned that being successful in school sometimes requires a philosophical shift. And we know PFA SBT requires us to start with the give and Dr. Hanley talks about that. Sometimes that's inconvenient, sometimes it's time consuming and sometimes it's messy, but it's critical for our early success. And this can be difficult to achieve in schools because the prevailing culture in some schools is in philosophical opposition to that basic idea. This process really pushes us to always place our values over procedures. We always make the decision that is the safest, the most televisable, and the most dignified for our learner so that we have to be willing to step out of power struggles to do this. And this can also be a hard sell in some schools. 
If you're struggling to create change in a school environment that you're working in, I've included some examples of resources that might be helpful for you here. There's a more comprehensive list of these items in the handouts, including links on how to access them. So you'll, you'll have access to those um, as part of this talk. It's important to assess the school environment right at the very beginning, prior to even starting PFA and SBT, to make sure you've got all the components in place that you need to be successful. So this involves asking some questions like, does the school team have the willingness to create space and time for the child to access their personalized or synthesized reinforcers? Does the school team have the willingness to support, for example, the implementers being able to attend weekly meetings to talk about and troubleshoot and train? Um, I've also included a resource to help you with this in your handout. It's, a, it's an example of an ecological assessment. And it's really just a list of questions, things to think about, um, things that are important philosophically and also just logistically. What do we need to plan for for this process to be successful? And finally, it's important to communicate with all stakeholders right from the very beginning and to foreshadow some basic understandings about the process. And that just helps all team members set reasonable expectations. So everybody needs to understand that building skills takes time. Behavior reductions are expected right at the very beginning in the treatment context with PFA and SBT. But changes outside of treatment, that comes when we begin the process of generalization. It's also important that everybody understands that we're still working to hold students to high expectations without the process. Um, Skill-based treatment does not mean that the student does what they want without limits. The reason we emphasize the give is because we also want to take some of the time. We ask the student to do hard things and to persist and to learn and stakeholders need to understand that too. Once we build these foundational skills, we're ready to tackle skill building. And this is the CAB 3 to CAB 5 part of the um, SBT process. This is where the design of our SBT branches becomes really important. And for the three students that I'm talking about today, we chose branch goals that considered what was both challenging and important for their success in the classroom context. So for two of our students, DM and JB, one of the things that triggered problem behavior for them in the classroom was lack of adult attention. And so we built a branch to try to address that. We, we made sure one of their branches was teaching them how to independently work and play so that they could tolerate those conditions. Um, a second EO for problem behavior was peer control over reinforcers. So anytime they had to share um, activities or materials or even control the theme of play, if that had to be shared with a peer, that could often evoke problem behavior. So we built a branch to address that too. We taught them how to be flexible in play. And then a third goal for those two students was just academic demands. We, we knew that when they were asked to engage in academic demands, that could be evocative for problem behavior. And so we decided to work on some academic work for them as well. Our third student had two similar goals, but we also included a, a branch for them for hygiene routines. So this was a student who um, was unwilling to brush teeth, was unwilling to wash hands. And that was really reported as something that would be a meaningful outcome for, for all stakeholders, including parents. So that's something we incorporated into our teaching. These are the data that show how the students progress through CABS three to five. And the, the mean trials, again, across these students vary, but all the students were able to achieve mastery with their goals. Um, R1s were at or near zero levels for all three students, and R2s were low in frequency and mild in intensity. So in this video clip, you'll see the student DM completing an independent play schedule. Um, he's got a visual that shows him what activity to start with. He takes that activity, completes it independently, cleans it up, puts it away, and then he checks his schedule to see what's next. And when the activities are all finished, uh, he's being taught to raise his hand to get the teacher's attention. I've sped up some of the parts of this video just to cut down on the time, so, um, but you'll get the idea.
I love the little dance that we get at the end of <laughs> pure joy. There is a wide scope for selecting SBT branch schools, and there are lots of sources of data to consider when we're making these choices, but here's a few school-specific recommendations. So first, we want to consider what the evocative learning contexts are for your students. Is it math? Um, is it being asked to work independently? Or is it having to share materials or toys with others? Whatever it is, we can design branches so that they directly address these evocative contexts to teach skills that could occur instead of problem behavior. Um, another consideration is just what's important to the relevant stakeholders. And with schools, the number of stakeholders is pretty broad. We got to think about the student themselves. Um, we want to think about parents and we want to think about all the members of the IEP team. We've got SLPs, sometimes OTs, classroom teachers, everybody's got priorities and we want to make sure that our process is reflecting the priorities of all of the stakeholders. We want to think about IEP goals. So consider aligning the SBT branch goals with the learner's existing IEP goals. Um, this might be helpful supporting you in allocating time for SBT sessions in schools. And it might also provide an effective process for ensuring the student actually masters these goals. And then another thing to think about is, is HRE for the student. So think about that student-led time and whether that contains challenges that prevent the learner from quick and reliable, happy, relaxed, and engaged. And it could be useful to build branches or, uh, or goals that address some of the areas of development that are missing for the student that are preventing them from really establishing a reliable HRE. I mentioned this previously, but we do expect pretty immediate reductions in problem behavior during treatment once we begin SBT. But it's still important to have a plan to follow for how to deal with challenges that might arise during outside um, of outside treatment time. And I think about this as kind of a short term plan while we're developing the tolerance and skills that are going to solve the problem in the long term. That's our SBT. But it it it. One of the things that we recommend is universal protocols. We don't have enough time to get into the details about it, but essentially they're personalized plans that are created to mitigate problem behavior. And if you are interested in finding out more details about universal protocol, there's lots of information on the FTF website. It's also helpful to understand the school IEP process, including FBAs, BIPs, and IEPs. These are all priorities for school teams. Again, there's a lot to say about how well PFA and SBT aligns with these processes. And we actually have an entire free course on how to do that. So the link to that course, if you're interested, is included in the handout for the talk. Once skills or contextually appropriate behaviors or CABs once those are taught, the next phase in SBT is to teach the learner to demonstrate these skills under challenging conditions. So for example, now that the learner is able to cooperate with math instruction from a teacher, the challenge conditions might be things like tolerating corrections or tolerating learning a completely new math concept, or it could involve teaching the learner to complete the math problems independently without support from a teacher and so on. So a challenge is really something that's added onto or tweaked about the branch, making it exactly that, just a little bit more challenging. What's difficult, I think, about teaching challenges in the school context is that there are so many things to consider, to prioritize, and to teach. It can be overwhelming, selecting and implementing appropriate challenges. And so there's a few things to think about. The first is to consider what is both difficult and necessary. A good challenge is both. Um, it's difficult for the learner and it's necessary for success in that terminal natural environment, the classroom. However, it's also important to ask yourself, is this a student problem or is this a classroom problem? If challenges in the classroom exceed what we would expect any child to tolerate, then we shouldn't have higher expectations for our uh, learner that we're supporting with PFA and SBT. A second consideration, is this a challenge or is this a branch? So we can ask ourselves, what's the child supposed to do? And do they have the skill to do it? If they don't have the skill, then that's 
better dealt with as a branch and we can add another branch into SBT to deal with that. But if they have the skill, they're just unable to do it under specific conditions. For example, when the door is closed or when the teacher's attention is diverted, then that makes a better challenge. And finally, consider what are the unplanned EOs that might be encountered in the classroom? So these are the accidental things that might happen that might evoke problem behavior. So it could be if something breaks or if the student has insufficient materials or if they have to share space or resources with other students. And we wanna, we wanna make sure that those things are all sufficiently addressed in SBT. Um, here's a tool that can be helpful in helping you identify what those challenges might need to be that are specific to the learner's classroom context. This is a classroom observation assessment. It's included in your handouts. Um, it's a direct observation tool that's composed of a series of questions about the learning environment. And the purpose is to help identify what is the student's baseline abilities in relation to the expectations in the classroom. So we wanna use this to help us identify challenges that might be specific to the classroom context that would be helpful and required of the learner in order for them to be successful. For the three students in our case study, we selected challenges for all three of the branches for all three of them, but I just included some examples here um, of challenges for one branch for each student, just to give you a sense of the variety of challenges based on the branch that was being targeted. So for Dan, in his academics branch, some of the challenges included being prompted and corrected. Um, another challenge was being observed. He really didn't like it when people were watching him work, but that was something that was encountered in his classroom. So we decided it was important to prepare him for that. Um, he didn't do well when the teacher's attention was diverted. And he also struggled with uh, when tasks were interrupted or changed unexpectedly. So we built those in as challenges. Um, for JB, we, we had a branch in place for him to learn how to be flexible with play. And so some of the challenges were um, when we got to his really high valued, most preferred toys. And um, the other thing that we taught as a challenge was how to handle it when um, peers opted out of playing, when they didn't want to play anymore. And then um, for JP in that hygiene routine, one of the challenges was that he would complete that routine independently. So without having um, somebody in the room with him kind of guiding him through it. Here's a video clip. So this video is JB learning two of his challenges. In the first clip, he's working on his shared play branch. And the challenge is that the implementer is asking him to share items that are really highly valued. The reason we chose the challenge is that this is something that evoked problem behavior in the classroom quite frequently for him when peers touched or played with items that were highly valued to him. And then in the, oh, actually, I think I just have one clip. Let's play it. So in that clip, he selected toys at the start and the teacher um, said, oh, no, I want to have that toy. I want to play with that one. And, and so um, that was a challenge for him. And he tolerated that really nicely here. So this is the final stage in the SBT process, generalization and extension. It's a critical stage in helping us achieve those meaningful outcomes of transitioning the learner to or back to the classroom environment. And we want to make sure that we have adequately prepared the learner for this in the previous stages of SBT. Again, it's it's really beyond the, the time we have um, today to talk about how to generalize effectively. And I actually think this is one of the phases that people underestimate the most. 
is not uncommon for people to kind of proceed with the train and hope approach to generalization. In other words, okay, we've taught a bunch of skills in SBT, it's time to go back to class, and we just hope that everything goes okay. And that approach is rarely sufficient. So we've got an entire consultation model and course sequences dedicated to supporting generalization and extension at FTF because it's complex and it's commonly, misun or commonly misunderstood. My best advice on approaching this phase is to continue to go back to your classroom assessment to identify whether anything is missing from, F from SBT. Introduce one change at a time and use flexible criteria for moving through the generalization and extension phases. Um, so here's some outcomes from our, our three students that we followed. We were able to have uh, really successful transitions for all three students um, into their uh, classroom environment. DM transitioned successfully into a grade one um, program. We followed him and provided support to the school team for the first four months of his transition. And he did exceptionally well with that transition. And he was also able to master all of the terminal objectives in the branches that we chose. Um, JB has done extremely well too. He no longer receives one-to-one -one support um, in the classroom. Uh, lots of decreases in problem behavior. And he was also able to master his um, terminal objectives. And his classroom teacher reported that peers are actually now a part of his HRE, which is a really nice outcome for him. And JP is in the process of transitioning back to his classroom. Um, he had really successful reductions in problem behavior all throughout the process. And he also mastered all of his terminal objectives across all the branches. So we, we found that our, our, our case study was pretty consistent with what the research has shown. We were effective at eliminating some problem behaviors. We were able to either reduce supports um, or fade supports for some students. Our students achieved their educational goals and it was socially valid. This was a process that was valued by stakeholders. We've encountered lots of barriers in the implementation of PFA and SBT in our own practice in schools. Some of these barriers are in our control to change and some of them are not. But this table is just a list of recommendations and thoughts to consider before, during, and after the implementation of PFA and SBT that will hopefully help support you and your team to achieving a meaningful outcome. And I've included this in the handouts for you. And one of the handouts you'll also have a copy of is this list of resources. So this is also designed to help support your efforts in planning for some of the common uh, psychological, logistical, and training barriers that you might encounter. I want to just quickly say a huge debt of gratitude goes to the incredible professionals who did all the hard work with these young learners that we talked about today. So big thank yous to Kaylee Bogdan, Lauren Amiot, Danielle Weiss and the entire team at SBAI. Awesome. Thank you so much, Dr. Claire Egan. That was just fabulous to be able to watch those students um, thrive and to see how SBT can be implemented in the schools. So I am going to hand it over to our Chief Commercial Officer and Advocate for One Million Kids, Rachel, and she's going to share a little bit how Hyrasmus can enhance um, the SBT process. Hi everyone, it's so good to see you all here. Uh, I'm just going to quickly show you what it looks like uh, to implement uh, SBT on Hyrasmus. We have a lot of folks that are in clinic settings, but also in school settings uh, that are using Hyrasmus to help equip their uh, their parapros and, and teachers and staff to uh, successfully implement SBT. And so I'd love to share uh, what that looks like for you all. All right, so first off, uh, we really wanna disseminate this. Um, and so we've made it available to everybody in our library. Uh, you can simply go to your library on Hyrasmus and, and add uh, the SBT template to any learner's profile. Uh, when you do that, it'll uh, automatically add that to the learner. And uh, we've 
created some instructions uh, along with uh, FTF uh, that um, are pretty broad, uh, but will help you keep focused on uh, the values first and foremost. Uh, and so we have some, some basic instructions, um, some things to consider during each step of SBT. And then there are also some targets that are going to be in there by default. Uh, the nice thing about this is these are customizable. So uh, as you're getting particularly into the different branches, you can really customize what those branches look like, what the text or how the text appears for your staff, uh, and really individualize those for uh, your learners in a really easy way. So I would love to show you um, from kind of an RBT's perspective, what that looks like. So uh, whenever they're getting ready to start with a learner, we always take you to a preparation page. So with SBT, for instance, I can always check out those instructions. And um, one thing I do wanna mention is you can add video models here on Hyrasmus um, that can be available in the instructions for the implementer. So um, I know Dr. Egan was talking about uh, the importance of generalizing um, uh, the, the skills to different environments. And one way you can do that really nicely is with the video models uh, so they can see exactly um, what it should look like at each stage for that learner. All right, when you hit play to get into your session, um, it's going to load all programs. Um, and for this particular learner, we have other programs that we're working on outside of SBT. And so I can easily see any other type of program that I'm, I'm working on and take data on those. Um, but for this particular example, I'm just gonna focus on this particular program. Uh, so you can see, uh, we always see in the green box what our current state is. So right now we're in SR. Uh, you can you can uh, keep it at normal, um, but you do have some options to uh, dial it back and take it a little bit easier on your learner or uh, make it more challenging. Um, and here my only focus is um, getting that learner in HRE. Um, you will see, I can see what's coming up. Uh, so I have a little sneak peek there and know kind of what to prep for um, as, as a practitioner. So here I'm gonna just document whether or not that was successful or if we observed any R1s or R2s. And it will take me straight to um, my, my terminal goal here, which is um, that CFCR. All right. Um, and you can see it takes me right back um, to, to the SR phase and I can document there. And it's going to randomize uh, what trial I'm, I'm being brought to here. So I can easily take data here um, and then I can go all the way through. Or if I do observe an R1 or R2 and wanna stop the process there, I can continue back to getting that learner to HRE. So I have a lot of flexibility uh, with how I um, am taking my data and um, making sure that I'm meeting that learner um, where they're at. Um, once criteria is met for any target in session, you can actually, uh, you'll get a notification letting you know that that learner has met that criteria. And then you have the option to um, master that out and then actually um, continue to make progress within a session. So um, it's really helping equip um, your practitioners to, to move things along um, at pace um, uh, with your learner um, and making sure that they're um, they're progressing. Um, I'm going to go ahead and stop sharing, and I want to throw it now to uh, Rob Spain. He's a BCBA uh, in uh, in some schools in California, and he's actually using Hyrasmus in the school setting. Um, and I think um, that his um, his take on it is going to be helpful um, for you all as an audience uh, to hear. So I'll throw it to you, Rob. Hey there, everyone. So I am a school-based BCBA uh, working in Central California. We have been using SBT uh, for a while now, but most successfully, we've been using it with High Rasmus. Uh, this has changed and continues to evolve the compassion in our school district is we, we tell everyone creating joy is a requirement and empowering students is a requirement of doing this. Um, 
We start with our kids with the most challenging behaviors. We've been working with various software platforms for 20 plus years. And this is the first one we can give to our techs in the classroom that they like and makes the whole process easier rather than more work. So that's a huge bonus. We've got about 26 team members now, mostly RBTs that are working uh, with the platform in some capacity. Uh, we're also using Hirasmus for our RBT training, as well as uh, implementation of uh, our SBT protocol. Um, we're starting off as our first year. We're implementing with a small and growing group of kids. Um, the perceptions have been great from the school district that we're in, from the members of our behavior team. Uh, the basic perception is that's a lot easier from the special education teachers and uh, special education technicians. They're saying, I get it. I can do that too. <laughs> and when people see us doing it, they go, we want that for more of our kids. Can you do that more often? Can you show me how? So high Erasmus in a school-based setting is increased our efficiency. It's increased the buy-in and it makes the whole thing a lot easier to do. Awesome. Thank you so much for sharing, Rob and Rachel. We're going to go ahead and open it up for some questions. And uh, Dr. Hanley and Dr. Uh, Egan, I don't know if it's easier for me to kind of read them to the whole group or if you want to go through the Q&A and pick some and read them out loud. You've got quite a bit. I'll, uh, I, I've been monitoring them. If you don't mind, I'll take a stab at combining yeah. a few. Um, awesome. First, there's a, there's a lot of questions about specific clients, and we really can't give that kind of feedback, but uh, there were some overlap on questions where there appears to be some head-directed SIB that appears to persist in reinforcement despite the child being HRE, et cetera. Historically, behavior analysts, we would call that automatically reinforced SIB if we've done a, a standard analysis, et cetera. I will tell you that that is a complicated behavior to treat. We do see that. I strongly recommend if you haven't seen that before or treated that before, you get consultation. I very rarely say these things. You need consultations. I've seen people around the world do this process from a free website without consultation. However, when it's head-directed SIB that is persisting despite your best efforts, I strongly recommend you get consultation. Those of you who are credentialed in the process, we do a thing at FTF called Big Ideas and New Discoveries. We invite all credentialed professionals to these the next, uh, the one in January, I believe, is on treating automatically reinforced head-directed SIB. In that talk, I will describe how we need to walk away from the concept of automatic reinforcement. It has not served us well. And reconsider the notion these are tick-like behaviors and reconnect with the, be the uh, behavioral literature on treating ticks. There's a lot more to it, but I hope you understand the main point. The main point is those behaviors are serious, hard to treat and you need consultation for those kinds of uh, behaviors for sure. There was another question about food. A lot of questions about foods. There's some moms here that had some questions <laughs> about foods. Okay, So I understand as someone who likes to cook for my children, I understand the, the motion and these kind of questions. Listen, folks, if, uh, if you can get away with doing SPT without food, do it without food. But if you leave the door open and they leave the search for food, that means you got to include food. If you include food, we say normalize and formalize it. Serve it up like grandma would in a plate, on a bowl, in a bowl, a snack size portion, on a mat, with a placemat, with napkin, with water. If the food's all done, go to the kitchen and have them help you prep for the next snack. Normalize and formalize food. Finally, if the student has uh, issues with obesity or genetic disorders uh, related to food, um, like Prader-Willi syndrome, et cetera, we have a program called Food Happens. Food has to be put on a time-based schedule. It's a very delicate treatment. Again, that requires consultation. So don't use food unless you have to. If you do, normalize and formalize it. If you can't, uh, please seek some support from folks who work with probably uh, or folks with metabolic disorders. Uh, okay, I'll stop talking for a minute. Maybe pass it to Claire or Rachel or, um, um, or uh, Rob to answer some of the other questions. I've got a, well, I just, just one popped up in the chat, um, Dr. Henley, and I'm, I'm kind of hoping that you'll address it because I think it's an important one. And I think it's one that maybe a lot of people will be interested in. And it's just this idea of 
Um, can we can we implement PFA and SBT when we are working with students who are experiencing trauma? I mean, you know, the interesting thing is this was not developed as a trauma informed procedure, as a trauma sensitive, a trauma assumed procedure, but it is. It is a trauma sensitive and a trauma assumed procedure. Everything trauma experts would say you want in a properly informed trauma therapy is in this. It's about shared control, giving choices, empowering the learner, making sure they're safe before you challenge them. It's all there. So there's an article uh, led by Dr. Raja Rahman published on trauma-informed applications of ABA. Uh, PFA and SPT is clearly part of that technology. Uh, and it's evolved to make it more closely aligned with trauma-informed care as we become better collaborators with those in that space. So listen, if you have a client that has a significant or a known trauma history and you're a behavior analyst, this is an extremely important process. And in fact, I think we should be doing this process in trauma-sensitive forms of ABA with all clients independent of trauma history. We kind of use those clients with trauma histories to teach us how to generalize those approaches we take with them to all our clients so we don't traumatize kids in the name of therapy going forward. Uh, so please give this a shot if you a student has clear and obvious uh, trauma history. Awesome. I saw a couple questions on ratios, particularly with watching um, the videos, uh, Dr. Egan. Uh, would one of you mind sharing a little bit about um, what should be good ratios when implementing SVT in the school setting? Yeah, I think um, certainly at the start of the process, we implement one to one. So, um, our, you know, we've got a, an implementer that's working directly one to one with the student, and that's typically happening in a pullout space rather than directly in the classroom for safety reasons. Um, although there may be some some exceptions to that. I I also want to chime in uh, on on this as well. Um, um, when I see the questions about supervision, I, I do think a lot about um, how we can use technology to help uh, empower um, and, and enable uh, supervisors a little bit more. Uh, and we have a lot of users on Hyrasmus that have found um, that there are certain capabilities on the platform, um, such as the ability to um, watch in real time multiple um, uh, data sets from, from multiple um, clinicians. Um, um, and, and provide some oversight and then hop in um, when needed um, can, can really uh, help provide more quality supervision across a, a larger caseload. Um, and then also um, the ability for uh, that direct uh, person or um, or clinician to be able to add a video uh, and then have a supervisor provide feedback asynchronously as well. Uh, so that can that can help uh, the ratio problem a little bit uh, uh, for, for quite a few. I'll add to what Rachel's saying and what Claire just provided. Uh, please know some of the questions suggest some problems and it seems like the problem is often rooted in two things. One is, that they're trying to implement this in a non-one-on-one -on -one situation. Understand this is what they call in schools a tier three intervention. This is one-on-one -on -one therapy. It is not meant to be done in small groups unless you're already expert at doing it one-on-one. -on -one. I have colleagues that do it in small groups, but they were expert already in the one-on-one -on -one version, which is the primary version. Second, it is a pull-out procedure. I know that's a bad word sometimes in schools and you're gonna have to work within the regulatory system to make this happen, but it is not meant to be done in a classroom with all the noise. If you're worried about other kids being jealous of the reinforcers and it being disruptive, we want you to do it the way it's described in the research, and that is to pull the child out to a new context without any contextual control of behavior. Get control of the behavior, teach the skills, and then transfer it back to the school. Do some people do this in the classroom from the drop? Yes, that's acceptable. But again, that's acceptable when you've already probably become expert in this. First case, I'd probably bring them outside and get to that quiet spot. Uh, the next thing is, this is hard to do with those uh, data sheets and whatnot. The data sheets work, but it's hard. This is so much easier, as Rob has described, uh, when staff have the proper tools. And this, this is the reason why I link up with Hyrasmus. This Hyrasmus platform is made for direct implementers to do this with much, much greater ease than they could do otherwise. If you're a BCBA, you might do a little direct in school, but you're relying on the EAs and the PARAs and the RBTs to do this. And this app really helps um, make that happen.
Awesome. Well, um, were there any other questions that you that caught your eye, uh, Dr. Egan or Dr. Hanley on the Q and A's? I know we're a little bit over time, so I might have time for one more. Sorry, I, I lost track. I tried to amalgamate the question. There's a lot of good ones. I'm sorry if we can't get to them, but you know, please reach out to us and figure out a way to connect. Uh, but I, I appreciate, uh, Amy, for you pulling all this together and being such a wonderful host. And I appreciate everyone being here and giving this a shot. Understand expanding your scope of competent, uh, competent scope of practice is hard. Uh, and so thank you for giving that a shot. Try to do it under ideal conditions first, not the most challenging conditions, and try to use all the tools available to you. Okay, thank you. Absolutely. Thank you, everyone, for attending today and learning and growing with us. I did put in the chat, I'd love to connect. You can follow us on LinkedIn or Facebook for future events and webinars. And you just thank you so much for being here today. I hope everyone has a great day. Bye.